Readings tonight do play a, a very key role in the overall message that God has for us. But specifically, the Old Testament and the Gospel are paired together intentionally. Hear now from Jonah chapter 3. It's almost the end of the story. He's, he's run away from God. He's been in the fish for three days. He's been spit out. And now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw that they did, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented and did not bring on them the destruction He had threatened. This is God's Word. Turning now to the New Testament, a letter written to Christians in Corinth. It, it's just a very thin slice of the overall message in Corinthians. But Paul in this message is talking about how this world is quickly passing away. So we are to live as a different kind of people from chapter 7. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. This is God's Word. As we then prepare to... A message does not have to be long to be powerful and effective. Why, well, just consider the Hawaii terror alert that went out. Ballistic missile threat inbound for Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Fourteen words. Powerful. Effective. So much so that for 40 minutes, almost 40 minutes, people believed it. And they ran for shelters. And they hugged and they cried and they texted to their families all of their goodbyes. Very powerful. Very effective. But as you consider that the missiles weren't really launched and it was just a false alarm, you would think, well, no harm, no foul. And yet there was damage to the faith and the trust that the people have in those who are in authority. So much that if the terror alert needs to be sent for real, who is going to have trust in it and believe that it's authentic? They'll always be in the back of their minds. Well, is it real or not? That's the reason that I found the readings for today so interesting. It involved three very short messages, short enough for Twitter, and people responded with faith and immediate responses. The first one, at only 13 words, come and follow me, I will send you out to fish for people. James and John, Simon and Andrew, they left their dads and the hired men, their boats, their tackle, they left their entire lives that they had known it and they immediately got up and they followed Jesus. Second message, a bit longer, three sentences at 17 words. Jesus said to the people, <clears throat> the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. And in large mass, people believed and responded with an active living faith. The third message, Jonah, which arguably had to have been the absolute worst and shortest sermon ever recorded, at only eight words, he walked a day into the city and stood on the street and said, Forty more days, Nineveh will be overthrown. The response, though, the Ninevites believed God. 
A fast was called, and from the greatest to the least of them, they put on their I'm sorry clothes, their sackcloth. These were very short, powerful messages, and you have to wonder, why would people believe them? I mean, it's just mind-boggling when you really consider the brevity and the impact. <laughs> but there could be at least three possible reasons why the Ninevites believed Jonah. And in each of these three reasons, why they're, they're used today to explain what happened back then, but they're also used now as excuses for not believing God ourselves. Here's what I mean. The first explanation of why the Ninevites believed Jonah was that they were gullible. Let's just be upfront here. I mean, they were just simple, superstitious folks who, who grew up in cultures that believed that there were gods and goddesses who occasionally got angry at human beings and would threaten them with you know, terrible weather or invasions of armies which would destroy their cities. And since they you know, lived in that kind of culture when the God of Israel sent his prophet Jonah, who said, 40 more days and you're doomed, they believed it because, well, they believed the gods did that kind of thing. They were gullible. We're so much more sophisticated now in that we understand there's a science behind severe weather, you know, highs and lows, and, and there, there are political reasons of why one nation would send its army against another nation. You know, we just, we would never believe a message like this ourselves, although it could explain why it happened for them. Okay, well, a second possible reason of why there was this mass conversion really has a, a very little divine agency behind it, and it's all about humans taking responsibility for themselves. You know, that it, the, the reasoning goes something like this, that the people of Nineveh, well, they were about to change anyway. You know, they, their culture, their society had become so vile and corrupt that, well, they just couldn't stand it anymore themselves. And here comes this itinerant preacher, this social reformer, Jonah, and, and uh, it was just the catalyst that they needed to really call for good reforms in their city. And in fact, we have many examples in our own American history of this happening. Well, I just think of Cary Nation right here in Kansas, you know, with their acts taking on the alcohol and the bars, and, and then we have prohibition, right? You know, an evil was addressed and people changed. And we just got through celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday on Monday. And think of all the good that he called us to from the bad from where we were. And even right now, we're living through the hashtag Me Too movement, which really a horrible behavior is being called to something much better. And so it must have been for the Ninevites. You know, they had this collective guilty conscience and... And finally, they, they just said, well, enough is enough. You know, and they, they, they now were living in their better selves. See, now, th this kind of belief is not a belief in God, but a belief in human beings. That, you know, human beings are basically good, and we're kind of evolving into our better selves all the time, and in which, you know, we care more about the environment and animals and climate change and, and dispossessed people and the marginalized. And it doesn't need a God, it just needs good people. And so that's kind of an explanation to, to use to explain what was going on, but also an excuse for us not to believe. Well, there's one more possible explanation, and it's kind of a reaction against the second one, in which, you know, enough of this political correctness stuff, there really is a God, and he's angry at sinners, so you better shape up because he's coming for you. You know, and this kind of reasoning looks at the natural disasters of wildfires out in California, and hurricanes in Texas, and and planes that fly into buildings as God's judgment against sinners. You know, what more do you need, right? Okay, this is the fundamentalist's God who's just angry at sinners, so shape up. Now, that's great if you're a fundamentalist. You're like rah-rah, but if you're not, it's like, I would never believe in a God like that, 
right? Like who would want a God like that? And so of all these possible reasons, well, which is it? Are we just gullible and we believe, you know, our religious experts? Or it's like, no, no, it's not about God at all. It's just people progressing on to their better selves. Or no, there is a God and he's angry and he's out to get you. Well, I suppose that you could successfully argue that there's a little bit of truth in each one of these answers, but none of them will give you the kind of life of faith with the true and living God which he is calling you into. So how are you going to get at the answer then of why the Ninevites changed, why people believed Jesus, why you may want to believe? It, you get at this not by looking at the examples of when people believed in great numbers, but when they didn't. You look at when Jesus engaged with people who had witnessed all kinds of his miracles and yet they still refused to believe. You go to Matthew chapter 12, and there you find Jesus in a conversation with Pharisees and teachers of the law, religious experts who were quizzing him and demanding, show us a sign. They wanted Jesus to do a, a personal miracle for them right then and there, convince me, and then I will believe. Now, they, of course, disregarded all of the miraculous healings Jesus had done up to that point, and casting out demons and restoring the crippled and the blind and the deaf. And, and they had disregarded how he had fed thousands of people with just two fish and five loaves of bread. But what they wanted was a demonstration on demand that would leave them dumbfounded. Do you know what they really wanted? They wanted the kind of faith of the gullible. You know, just this blind faith that I just can't debate it, I can't deny it, I just have to believe it, no matter what. And as they really pressed on to Jesus, what they were really wanting was for him to convince them and that, well, yeah, if you're right and we're wrong and we're just too bullheaded to change, then, well, just force us. If you're God, force us to believe. In the end, they were wanting the fundamentalist God who just gets his way no matter what. But Jesus, of course, will not go along with their request. In fact, he answers them by saying, this wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he went on to tell them that the men of Nineveh will stand up in, on the judgment day against this generation and condemn it because they repented when the prophet Jonah preached but now something even greater than Jonah is here. But what, what is that something greater? If God is not asking for us just to simply be gullible and blindly believe whatever we are told, and if he's not going to force our hearts to believe, then, then what is this that even the Ninevites, the Ninevites could recognize and respond with faith? What is this something greater and the answer is a one-word sermon. One word. Grace. For the Ninevites, it was a grace given in the undeserved delay of 40 days. You and I just hear that God's going to get them, right? They're going to be doomed. What they heard was 40 days. We have a chance. We have an opportunity. What an, what an unlikely candidate for grace, these Ninevites who were unbelievers, enemies of God's people, who were notorious sinners, who were extremely cruel to their own and abused their power against their neighboring cities. And yet even to them, God extends his grace. Shall I not care about this city? There are 120,000 people here and many cattle. He even cared about the animals. Grace was extended. God didn't force them. They, they could have said no to all of this. And, and they weren't simply being asked to be gullible and believe whatever. But do you know what they were? They were not gullible, but humble. And there before God, they showed their humility and their willingness to receive His grace. Just listen to their own words. They said, 
Well, let everyone urgently call on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and have compassion and turn from his fierce anger. They weren't making demands on God. They were humbly before him with beggars' hands, who then found that their hands were filled with the grace of God. They were not progressing towards this on their own by humans being really good humans. God had to confront them through his prophet. But he did confront them because he cared about them and he wanted not to bring his destruction but give them a life of faith, of grace. And here we are, brothers and sisters, as you heard in 1 Corinthians. The time is short. This world, as we know it, is quickly passing away. But it's still a moment of grace. Judgment Day is coming. But it's not today. Today is a day of God inviting us into his open kingdom. And an invitation from Jesus who says, come and follow me. And it is this good news that the kingdom of God is open to even the most unlikely of candidates, you and me. And, and that the Holy Spirit has convinced us in the death and resurrection, there is my welcome and grace of God that he gives us the ability to immediately, immediately respond with faith and say, well, I believe and I will follow. And to know that then this isn't just a faith that acknowledges, yeah, there's a God and, and, and yeah, there's a judgment day and yeah, Jesus has done the cross and resurrection for me. It's the kind of faith that is relational. You're, you're invited into a relationship to come and follow Jesus in which you, you actually consider you know, how you're involved in the Me Too movement and how you're responsible for that, your actions, your thoughts. And you, you actually consider then, well, how, how am I in my race relationships? You know, and because, just simply because you're not a racist doesn't mean you, you're still not involved in the race dialogue. And, and you think about, you know, this, this weekend is, is Life Sunday and people are out marching in D.C. And, you know, how is my life supporting and encouraging uh, the, the support of the unborn? See, these are real things in which we are turning from our evil and in a relationship with the God of grace who isn't angry with us but inviting us into a life of faith and goodness and love which has an impact on the rest of the world. May the Lord bless you as you live in faith and this grace. Amen. It was a little longer than eight words. <laughs> <laughs>